Good morning. So welcome to uh, UVI's subspecialty day rounds. The uh, title of our uh, presentation are uh, Infectious Posterior UV Disease Diagnoses Not to Miss. Uh, we are going to present uh, some common posterior UV disease that are vision threatening, some uncommon ones that are definitely ocular emergencies, and some more unusual posterior UV disease, and some that are ubiquitous and you should always test for. So really the question that you need to ask yourself when you're confronted with a patient that you think is has inflammation in their eye is, is it infectious or is it not? This is a very important question. And this is answered really through an accurate and thorough history, uh, and complete ophthalmic and physical examination. And then, of course, the key is the formulation of differential diagnosis. And then laboratory testing and or intraocular fluid sampling is used to confirm or exclude the diagnosis uh, of certain infections or non-infectious diseases. There are certain key considerations. Those are the exposure risks, for example, sexually transmitted diseases, HIV status, tuberculosis exposures, systemic illnesses. These are things that you would glean on your uh, examination review of systems, constitutional symptoms, organ, other organ system involvement, um, the nutritional status of the patient, and their, their immune status. So whether or not this is acquired um, or iatrogenic or uh, through age. As, as we age, uh, our immune status wanes a little bit. And then, of course, local factors, including uh, recent surgery and trauma. The anatomic location of the uh, uveitis is uh, extremely important, particularly with respect to where in the back of the eye, what tissue is involved. For example, is it a retinitis? as you might see in a patient with a necrotizing herpetic retinitis, or is it a choroiditis, say, for example, where TB would more uh, commonly present? Is it a uh, unifocal or posifocal disease, as, as you might see in to toxoplasmosis, or multifocal, as you might see in certain types of herpetic infections? And then, are the vessels involved? Uh, certain, certain types of UV disease will affect the veins more than the arteries. Uh, and then, is the optic nerve involved? Is this a neuroretinitis because your differential diagnosis for a neuroretinitis will uh, be different than it is for other infectious uh, etiologies? Laterality is important uh, in that many infectious UV disease will present unilaterally. For example, uh, necrotizing herpetic retinitis frequently will present unilaterally, although it may become a bilateral. Toxoplasmosis, toxoparesis are frequently unilateral. Uh, uh, other associated signs on the examination, such as elevated intraocular pressure, stigmata of herpetic infections, such as sectoral iris atrophy, corneal scarring, can give you a clue to the diagnosis. But laterality is obviously not always helpful, as there are some patients with B27-associated uveitis that can present with, with hypopia on uveitis. The differential diagnosis, I like to think of it in just broad categories. Is it viral? Uh, is it commonly viral, such as herpes, that would be the most common thing, and then less common uh, uh, infections, such as emerging infections, uh, depending upon where, the, where in the world the patient might be coming from, uh, bacterial in infections, fungal infections, uh, particularly endogenous type of fungal infections, uh, protozoal infections, such as toxoplasmosis, and then helminthic. Uh, intraocular fluid uh, and tissue sampling is very important, particularly in uh, presentations in which it is really difficult to just make the diagnosis based on pattern recognition. So in the case uh, up here, this no one would uh, mistake this for a diagnosis of toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis, or in an immunocompromised patient uh, in the uh, correct clinical context, this is CMV retinitis. However, you cannot tell just by looking at this what this might be, and in immunocompromised patients, this could be many different uh, diagnoses, as is this uh, multifocal subretinal infiltrates in an elderly patient could represent infection, it could represent non-infectious UVIs or malignancy. So that in uh, UVIDs in which the etiology is unclear or the, the um, uh, response to therapy is atypical, uh, or the systemic workup is an inconclusive, intraocular fluid analysis, either from the anterior chamber of the vitreous or sampling the retina or the cori, can be helpful in distinguishing between an intraocular infection or a malignancy where the differential between this is extremely important in terms of treating the patient and may impact on the systemic health of the patient. Um, therapeutic principles, um, obviously you do not want to treat an infection with steroids uh, without appropriate specific antibi uh, antibiotic cover. 
Um, the basic principle is to think about this in a broad differential diagnosis. So if you see a patient with um, a uh, indeterminate diagnosis, um, you will obtain uh, laboratory testing uh, and you will uh, maybe sample their vitreous or their anterior chamber, but you want to treat broadly and treat the infection that could most likely uh, destroy the eye, frequently treating with multi-antimicrobial uh, treatment and then withdrawing therapy as your laboratory uh, laboratories become uh, available or more information becomes available on the patient. Corticosteroids are useful, particularly topically, to treat inflammation, but should never be used as monotherapy in patients with infectious uveitis. That being said, corticosteroids can be very helpful in treating the uh, inflammatory component of infectious uh, diseases after the appropriate installation uh, and, and commencement of antimicrobial therapy. In general, we do not treat uh, intravitreal with intravitreal steroids, uh, as this can uh, result in you know, unbridled uh, viral replication. And then, it is always important to reevaluate your your patient uh, uh, on a regular basis and reconsider your diagnosis if they are not responding in the way that you think. So, our first presenter is going to be uh, Dr. Shakur. We have the. Uh, honor of our entire UBI's division presenting here, so I hope you enjoy this. Thanks, Dr. Thank you. Uh, where'd the computer go? Oh. Hang on. Oh. <laughs> Got it. All right, now I have to lower the mic. Al has a little bit of a height advantage here. But um, I'm going to present uh, a couple of patients, but the first one is, uh, is a resident, uh, I'm sorry, a fellowship nightmare. Uh, we've all had a few of those, and this one, we really were at a loss of, uh, as to how we could have proceeded differently. A 61-year-old gentleman, um, African American with a history of systemic sarcoidosis presented to us in California in 2010, in August. Um, and for two months, he had a history of blurry vision and photophobia in the left eye. And he'd been diagnosed a few weeks earlier by a local ophthalmologist with anterior uveitis. He's diabetic, hypertensive, has gout, uh, chronic renal disease. And in late 2005, he complained of progressive fatigue, ataxia, falling, and confusion. He's diagnosed with neurosarcoidosis based on a thoracoscopic biopsy of his hilar lymph nodes, um, which showed non kz 18 granulomas. He came in with hydrocephalus, meningoencephalitis, and a lymphocytic predominant pleocytosis. He was initially treated with uh, steroids and uh, methotrexate at a fairly low dose. And in 2007, began to have worsening pulmonary sarcoid with restrictive lung disease. Uh, in 2009, he was started uh, on treatment with Celsept to a final dose of three grams a day. And he began to uh, develop cardiac conduction abnormal uh, anomalies that would presume secondary to sarcoidosis. Don't forget to check people's hearts when they have sarcoid. His past ocular history was really only significant for cataract extraction in the past and um, a history of zoster to the first division of the trigeminal nerve on the left side. His examination was significant for uh, a little bit of a afferent pupillary defect which I thought may just be my imagination. And for the residents, which appendage is this? <laughs> Anybody? Ashley? The nose. Yes, and what do you see on the nose? <laughs> uh, it looks like there's some uh, vascular abnormality. Yeah, so it's a nodular kind of uh, dermal or postdermal rash. Uh, and what do you call this in sarcoidosis? Anybody? Lupus Very good. Yeah. So this is very good. So, so this is lupus pernia, which is a 
and for hallmark of uh, cutaneous sarcoidosis. He had that. Um, his anterior chamber showed one plus cell, three plus flare. He had one plus cell in his anterior vitreous and a lot of haze. So, and you can see a little bit of uh, posterior vitreous cell in the OCT on both sides. He's diagnosed with anterior and intermediate uveitis, likely secondary to sarcoidosis with a small, small afferent pupillary defect. Um, his infectious labs were negative, so a few days later we injected him with a subtenon scanlog in the left side. He was seen in follow-up. He uh, reported improvement in his photophobia, but no improvement in vision. And now, although his vision was the same at 2200, he now has a 1.2 log afferent pupillary defect. And um, I cannot stress how important it is to actually measure an afferent pupillary defect. Judith Warner and I would agree on one thing here. Um, but <laughs> measure them because they do change. And when they change, it's important to image. His cell has improved. His uveitis has improved. His OCT shows a little bit of swelling. But we recommended an MRI to look at his optic nerve. This gentleman does have neurosarcoidosis. Um, Lee, uh, what do you see on this MRI? Is, this, is part of his brain missing, or is this something else? <laughs> well, it looks like that, but it's actually uh, it's a flow artifact from his uh, uh, ventricular shunt. So when things flow rapidly uh, in, in, in T1, you end up with a, a, a void, a flow void. Anyway, that's just cool. And then his optic nerve over here, this prechiasmal optic nerve, you can see a little bit of contrast enhancement. So he was diagnosed with an optic neuropathy in consultation with our neuro-ophthalmology neuro colleagues in San Francisco and with neurology. We presumed that this was sarcoid optic neuropathy. He was treated with IV solumedrol for five days, started on Remicade a week later, continued on Celsept, and transitioned to oral prednisone at 60 milligrams. His vision continued to decline until two days later, he was no light perception in the left eye. Bad. And then he disappeared for a month. And when he comes back a month later, he complains of decreased vision in his right eye, as well as unsteadiness of gait. He is now no light perception and 2040 in the right eye. He's got a complete afferent pupillary defect. And what do we see here? Conradi. Yeah. So whitening of the retina. But what do you see in somebody with uveitis? Would you expect such a clear view? No, right? So that's something to keep a note of. And you can see in the periphery, he's got areas of retinal whitening here as well. And his OCT, Chris, if you can tell me where the location of the whitening is. So the inner retina. So you can see like there's a complete loss of retinal architecture over here. So could this be sarcoid panuveitis? That's unlikely on so much immunosuppression, and you certainly don't expect to see retinal whitening. Could it be viral retinitis? So we performed a vitreous tap. We admitted him to neurology for IV acyclovir. Uh, uh, lumbar puncture was also performed, and this PCR of his vitreous and CSF was positive for varicella zoster virus. We recommended stopping the solumedrol and switching from IV acyclovir to gancyclovir and foscarnet. And we started intravitreal injections of gancyclovir and foscarnet alternating at high dose. Unfortunately, over the next three days, he continued to prog uh, progress. And this retinal whitening is now splitting his fovea. So, this is a gentleman with systemic sarcoidosis presenting initially as neurosarcoidosis. He has anterior and intermediate uveitis. 
He has retrobulbar <coughs> optic neuropathy. He was presumptively treated with high-dose steroid and immunomodulatory therapy, as you would in somebody with neurosarcoid and optic neuropathy. And he ends up with a necrotizing herpetic retinitis in the right eye and worsening optic neuritis in the left. So optic neuropathy in an immunocompromised uh, person with neurosarcoidosis, and this is progressive outer retinal necrosis in a patient with severe autoimmune disease with an iatrogenic component. So progressive outer retinal necrosis um, is a rapidly progressive necrotizing retinal uh, retinitis, usually caused by varicella zoster virus in about 70%, and 30% caused by herpes simplex 1 or 2. It's typically seen in patients with a CD4 count of less than 50. Visual outcomes are poor. This, is, uh, this has an abysmal prognosis, even with antiviral therapy. It's been reported in other immunocompromised states as well, including after bone marrow transplant, after lymphoma, after high-dose steroid, and classically seen in patients with HIV and AIDS. It's been reported as well, just a few years before I saw my patient, when optic neuropathy, which was presumed to be inflammatory in nature, ended up being infectious and treated with systemic corticosteroids. This is a patient treated by Dr. Davis at Bascom Palmer. So was the optic neuropathy secondary to sarcoidosis or varicella zoster? I think we very well proved to ourselves that it was infectious, unfortunately. How do we treat this patient without exacerbating his systemic disease? Neurology did not want to stop uh, steroids, did not want to stop Remicade, and did not want to stop Celsept. Cardiology didn't want to either. This patient was quite ill. Um, with that level of immunosuppression, treatment of this patient's eyes is doomed to fail. What's his prognosis? Well, I can tell you now, five years later, he's still 2040, but his visual field is less than five degrees. So necrotizing viral retinitis include acute retinal necrosis, progressive outer retinal necrosis, and CMV retinitis. I'll leave out the last three in the interest of uh, the last one in the interest of time. This is a 54-year-old gentleman referred to us some years back for iritis. Um, when you look in the back, you can see that there's a little bit more going on. Um, Eric, you're going to be my fellow next year, so I might as well pick on you. What do you see here? Yeah. So kind of this retinal whitening in the periphery, multiple foci started to become confluent uh, with some hemorrhage, but not a lot. So this is acute retinal necrosis. It's a necrotizing retinitis caused by herpes simplex or varicella zoster. <coughs> Patients with RN are usually immunocompromised, but it may also be seen in, uh, immunocompetent, but it may be seen in the immunocompromised. Patients come in with hot eyes, moderate to significant vitritis, optic disc edema, and an optic neuropathy if not treated promptly. Bilaterality will happen in 70% after, after a month. It's a clinical diagnosis, but it can be fortified by using PCR for, verse, uh, for the herpes uh, viruses and for toxoplasma because there is a uh, atypical toxoplasma with retinitis that can mimic uh, ARN. Conventionally, you treat this with IV acyclovir. Uh, without treatment, there will be involvement in 20 to 70% in the other eye. Systemic a cyclovir reduces that risk to, uh, to, six, uh, to 13%. Other treatment protocols, the one that I favor, uh, um, uh, oral valacyclovir to a dose of two grams three times a day, gives you IV equivalent levels. Uh, intravitreal gancyclovir or intravitreal foscarnet may be used. Oral prednisone may be added. Aspirin may be associated with better visual outcomes. Late findings do include 
uh, pigmentary changes, retinal detachment does happen in about 70%. Barricade, la barricade laser, however, is controversial, uh, and retinal detachment is complicated. Lots of PVR, you need a buckle, you need oil. Here's a uh, orange retina that seems to be clearing a little bit. You can see that the, there's perivascular clearing of the um, retinitis, and ultimately, this progresses into kind of this Swiss cheese appearance with pigmentary changes, resolving retinitis, and that's why they get retinal detachments. Here's a 34-year-old patient with HIV and a CD4 count um, at 10. Um, you can see a lot of retinal whitening, a little bit of blood, but not very much. But what stands out here is how clear the view is. The absence of vitritis make, makes you think about immunocompromised states. This is progressive outer retinal necrosis, a better example and more typical example than the patient I presented in the beginning. This is a herpetic uh, retinitis in immunocompromised patients with rapidly progressive multifocal lesions, lower level of vitritis and vasculitis, and whereas ARN spreads rapidly, this um, spreads like, well, like nobody's business. This, uh, this can wipe out the entire retina in a couple of days. The treatment for this is either a cyclover foscarnate or gancyclover. IV th treatment is recommended. High dose intravitreal uh, gancyclover foscarnate or their combination, and these progress despite treatment. So in conclusion, remember viral retinitis is not always something you see uh, that you did not cause. A viral retinitis can be iatrogenic. Uh, we do immunosuppress more and more patients uh, in this era and do look for infectious UV disease in the immunocompromised. And then most importantly, just as a uh, kind of a wide statement, always dilate the pupil in an eye with uveitis. Anterior uveitis is often not anterior. Thank you to the photographers. Okay, uh, skip. Do we have time for questions? No. Which is yours? Okay, good morning. I'll be pre presenting three cases today um, and then do a brief overview of the disease process. This isn't a mystery diagnosis, and we'll do a brief review of the literature. So the first case is a 17-year-old Hispanic man that came in with blurry vision in one eye, mild discomfort. He had a non-contributory past medical and ocular history. Vision in the affected eye was slightly decreased at 20-25. He had normal pupils and pressures. And the affected eye had a mild anterior chamber reaction with two plus vitreous cell a little bit of haze, and we can see the photo of the left eye, a little bit of hazy view just overlying the lesion, which is some retinal whitening along the inferior arcade associated with hemorrhage, and you can see at the lower part of the arcade maybe an area that looks a little more pigmented or atrophic, which we can see in this photo, so a pigmented scar. This is an OCT through the area, normal temporally, and then on the nasal side there's a hyperreflective infiltrate of the retina. Fluorescent angiography early shows some blockage in the area of retinal hemorrhage, and then later some hyper, um, hyperfluorescence or leakage in the area of retinitis, and a little bit of retinovascular leakage. Of note, also in the peripheral retina, distant to the area of, active, of activity, there's also some retinal vascular leakage. So this patient has anterior chamber reaction, vitreous inflammation, and a chorioretinal lesion, so that makes um, fits the diagnosis of a panuveitis, and a unilateral panuveitis, top of the differential is infection, 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 so ocular toxoplasmosis, a viral retinitis, could be syphilis or TB, and then lower on the list would be um, an inflammatory um, panuveitis. So this patient walked into the clinic, he was young, he had good vision, you don't know what his immune status is, so he received an AC tap, checking for a viral PCR, um, and they injected intravitreal clindamycin to cover toxo as well as phoscarnate to cover viral, viral etiologies. These are the labs that were checked, and they were started on Valtrex and Bactrim. Seen a couple days later, the serum 
um, Toxo IgG was positive but had a negative IgM, and the PCR was negative for, for all things checked. <coughs> However, the sensitivity of PCR for toxoplasmosis of an aqueous sample is under 50 percent. So um, with retinal whitening adjacent to a pigmented scar, those are the buzzwords for ocular toxoplasmosis, so he was treated as such for presumed ocular toxoplasmosis. He received Bactrim, um, six to eight weeks, BID, he also had azithromycin for a portion of that period, and oral steroids was added a couple days after antibiotics. Final visual acuity was 2020, and this is um, the resolved lesion, just a hyperpigmented scar. This is a similar case, 21-year-old woman from Venezuela, so also a Hispanic um, woman. She notes she had some kind of eye infection when she was younger, wasn't sure which eye, vision's mildly affected, pressure's high, also has a mild anterior chamber reaction and some vitritis. A similar photo, so nasal to the nerve, there's a hyperpigmented chororetinal scar with adjacent retinal whitening, and we can see some periphlebitis as well. Interestingly, in the other eye, she has 20-20 um, vision, asymptomatic, and she also has a hyperpigmented scar, nasal to the nerve, with some fibrosis on the nerve. So, These are the buzzwords, focal area of retinal whitening adjacent to a pigmented scar, so all the residents are going to nail this case on the mock world boards. Ocular toxoplasmosis. She was uninsured, self-pay, so we were trying to really limit the cost of this workup. It looked really classic. Um, we just did a, a very limited lab workup which was normal, ruling out HIV and syphilis, and she was treated as ocular toxo with a great result. And that's the atrophic scar. So um, a different case with a different outcome. This may seem familiar. I presented this last month at the Grand Rounds for morbidity and blindness. A 39-year-old woman that had come to us a year after her symptoms had started, decreased vision in the left eye, non-contributory medical history, but she was from Mexico. We looked at outside records, and a year before, she had provided, she had presented to an outside provider with floaters and blurred vision, also what someone else called pink eye, so you can assume some anterior chamber reaction, redness, and pain. The vision was 2400 at the time. They noticed a diffuse vitritis, um, and then diffuse retinal thickening on the OCT, which they were saying was consistent with macular edema. So their plan was to do a workup for panuveitis and see her back a few days later. Vision was unchanged. This was the workup they did for the panuveitis, so they ruled out syphilis, um, said they had a normal chest x-ray and PPD, and then they checked VZV and HSV antibodies, which were positive in the serum. We typically don't check them because a lot of us are exposed and it's not causative for the retinitis. So at this point, they felt it was non-infectious and injected intravitreal triamcin alone. So they thought, oh, it improved initially. She went from 2,400 to 2,200 for a few weeks. And then a couple months later, she comes back with worsening vision again, now has mutton fat KP, a diffuse vitritis, and so they re-inject triamcin alone into the eye. So she came to us several months after that. Unfortunately, her vision had declined to light perception only, 2 plus APD. Um, she's had some mild anterior chamber inflammation, now a diffuse PSC cataract from the intravitreal steroids, diffuse vitritis. And this is a photo, very hazy view, but you can see multiple areas of retinal whitening confluent. Um, here's another island of retinal whitening. And this is an optos photo, um, which gives us a little bit of a different perspective. And you can see in the infrotemporal quadrant, there's a vessel that looks elevated, so there's a subretinal fluid and a uh, retinal detachment on ultrasound. So we'll talk a little bit about ocular toxoplasmosis and management, and then we'll come back to that last case. So toxoplasma is an intracellular protozoa, infects over a third of the human population worldwide. That number is a lot higher in Latin American and South American countries, over 80%. Most people are exposed either through undercooked meat or more commonly contaminated water or soil. Um, infection in the retina can be reactivation of a congenital infection, or there's evidence now that most cases are acquired postnatally. And congenital infections typically are bilateral, 75% of the cases, and they're more likely to involve the macula. So congenital, it's 60% involvement of the macula. In acquired cases, less than 40%. Retinal whitening adjacent to a scar. The diagnosis is clinical. Serologies can help, especially to rule it out. Um, and then it's the number one cause of infectious posterior uveitis worldwide. 
So exam findings, like we mentioned, I put an asterisk near marked vitritis because sometimes it's not a diffuse vitritis, but just a clump of vitreous cells overlying the areas of, active, of activity. Or if they're immunocompromised, there can be a lack of vitritis. So vascular sheathing, as we saw on the fluorescein angiography, can be separate from the, the area of activity. Anterior uveitis can be um, fine KP or mutton fat KP. Um, high IOP, so that I think second case I showed had an intraocular pressure of 25, and that's, um, that can be classic. And then these periarterial plaques, which is a term I don't know how to pronounce. So is treatment necessary? In immunocompetent patients, the lesions become inactive with well-defined borders within six to eight weeks, even without treatment. So there's little firm evidence that shows that antimicrobial therapy alters the natural course or the visual outcome of disease in immunocompetent patients. Um, so if we think back to that other patient, and you know, as doctors, first do no harm. If this patient had never even gone to an eye doctor, she may have fared better in the long run. Um, in 2016, a Cochrane review was published um, looking at antibiotics versus no treatment for toxoplasmosis, and it's summarized in this um, vague statement. Treatment with antibiotics probably reduces the risk of recurrence, but there's no good evidence showing that it leads to better visual outcomes. However, absence of evidence of effect is not the same as evidence of no effect. So there's definitely cases everyone's in agreement for treating. If it's near the fovea or macula, or sorry, fovea or optic nerve, if they're symptomatic, significant vitritis, um, a large size of a lesion, persistence after time, multiple lesions, and then we always treat pe pregnant patients, immunocompromised patients, and congenital infections. Um, so there are some providers that will just monitor a peripheral small lesion that's asymptomatic. I think in our department, we treat every active lesion we see. And classic treatments, triple therapy, so sulfadiazine, pyrimethamine, and folinic acid. The pyrimethamine causes decreased platelets and white blood cells, so that's why we use the folinic acid. And then there's many alternative treatments described in the literature that are better tolerated. And then briefly touch on oral so steroids and the use of ocular toxo. So typically if there's a significant inflammatory vitreous response, I'll add oral steroids 48 hours after starting antibiotic therapy. So steroids themselves aren't contraindicated in ocular toxoplasmosis, but unchecked steroids, meaning the use of steroids, especially periocular steroids in the absence of antibiotic therapy is a um, contraindication. So that's stated here. So absolute contraindication, we think it can cause um, uninhibited retinal necrosis. So inappropriate use, there's many cases in the literature showing disastrous outcomes when we inject intraocular steroids in an eye with toxo. Um, and there's some wise words in the middle there from an ophthalmologist in a Latin American country <coughs> reminding us to consider toxoplasmosis for any panuveitis in an exposed patient population rather than assuming it's an autoimmune process. And then there is some appropriate way to use intravitreal steroids. There's reports of using dexamethasone intravitreally, which is much shorter acting, concurrently with clindamycin intravitreally with, with good outcomes. Um, for prophylaxis, you can imagine if you have a patient that, has, that was recently treated or they have an inactive scar, but that's close to the fovea or the optic nerve, you want to be able to prevent recurrences in the future. Um, so using Bactrim, one tab, three days a week, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, has been shown to reduce the risk of recurrence. But typically we thought it was just when they're on that medication. Once they stop it, the recurrence rate goes back to normal. There's some new evidence from a group out of Brazil that shows that Bactrim, one tab every other day, treating for about a year, can have some long-lasting effects. This was a randomized um, double mass trial with 141 patients. They all had active lesions initially, treated with six weeks of Bactrim, those lesions healed, and then they were randomized um, one to one to receive either Bactrim every other day or placebo for 311 days, so that's just under a year. And they showed the recurrence rate for the treated group was zero for three years compared to an increasing rate of recurrence in the, treat in the group that received placebo. For pearls, this is a clinical diagnosis. Um, serology can help rule it out, and then an AC tap, remember the, the sensitivity is, is um, about 50% or less. If you have a patient in your office and you're not sure what it is, they have significant vitritis, you can inject things to cover for multiple etiologies, antivirals, clindamycin, just don't inject steroids alone if you don't know what it is. And dilate every patient with uveitis.
Lynn Hassman, the uveitis fellow. This is a case of multifocal chorioretinitis and drenching fever. So uh, this is a patient, 63-year-old uh, female with a five-day history of blurry vision in her right eye um, that followed a three-week history of a flu-like illness. So she has no significant past medical, ocular, or family history, but on a review of systems, she has joint pain, muscle pain, fatigue, chills, night sweats. She has a follicular um, type rash on her arms and legs. She has new frontal headaches, some neck stiffness, kind of some mental slowing, and sinus congestion. So she's obviously sick. Um, her exposure history is significant for some mosquito bites earlier this summer that this patient presented in the fall, and general HSV. So in the right eye, her vision is 20-30. There's one plus AC cell and a little bit of vitreous cell. And in the um, right fundus, you can see these round white lesions kind of along the, the arcades and then extending up above and down below. And it doesn't show well in this picture, but there's also some intraretinal hemorrhages in the peripheral macula. The left eye, the vision is 2015. There's not really any AC or vitreous cell, but she has a few similar lesions um, kind of looking superiorly from the optic nerve into the um, superior periphery. Her fundus autofluorescence um, is normal in the center of the macula where she didn't have any spots, but along the inferior arcade, especially in the right eye, you can see there's kind of this hyper-autofluorescent lesion with a hypo-autofluorescent center. And if we zoom in a little bit, um, you can see there's that lesion that kind of looks like a target. And then there's some other um, hyper and hypo-autofluorescent changes in the area that we saw those white lesions. Her fluorescein angiography in the right eye, the more affected eye, shows an early blockage right there in the upper right frame, and then late staining, which is typical of an inflammatory lesion. And the left eye has um, pretty minimal changes, probably not showing up very well, but in the area where she had those white spots, there's also some staining. <coughs> the ICG, we can also see these lesions on ICG, and following sort of a similar pattern in the right eye, um, are, are on the superior and inferior arcades and branching out from there. And then in the left eye, um, into the superior near periphery. So um, this imaging is basically showing us that the retina is involved, we see that on the fluorescein, and that something is blocking this ICG signal either at the level of the RPE or deeper in the choroid. So the FA and ICG lesions kind of correspond, again, you can see this pattern that's sort of following the arcades and then branching out. So on the OCT, the right eye, you can see starting at the top, the, the center of the um, macula, the fovea there, looks pretty normal. The retinal architecture looks normal. There's not a lot of vitreous cell. You can see some early vitreous separation um, in the nasal side on your right, and also some hyperreflectivity of the RNFL there. But then if we move down to the level of the inferior arcade where those lesions were, in the right eye, you can see there's vitreous cell, there's vitreous separation, there's hyperreflectivity in the RNFL, as well as along the RPE. You can see this kind of um, sort of clumps of hyperreflectivity at the level of the RPE and a loss of that overlying ellipsoid layer or the junction between the inner and outer segments of the photoreceptors. Um, and then so we have similar changes in the left eye, the less, less dramatic. The center fovea architecture is normal. And then looking kind of superiorly in the left eye in this, in this lower picture, you see some vitreous cell and RNFL hyperreflectivity. So the differential diagnosis for this patient, based on that characteristic appearance of the lesions, sorry to everybody who took boards yesterday and this presentation's coming later, but this is West Nile virus, probably. Um, but we, have, we always include some other infectious etiologies in our differential, particularly tuberculosis and syphilis. They can look a lot of different ways. Sarcoidosis would be an inflammatory process that could present in a, in a multitude of ways. And then um, inflammatory white dot syndromes, uh, including MUDES, PIC, multifocal choroiditis with panuveitis, acute posterior multifocal plaquoid pigment epitheliopathy, or AMPI, um, and Azor. So her laboratory workup showed positive IgM and IgG for West Nile virus and negative um, workup otherwise. She had a mild thrombocytopenia, probably going along with her acute febrile illness. So West Nile virus clinical infection, the incubation period for this disease is 2 to 14 days, and it presents in patients in a variety of ways. The majority of people, 70 to 80 percent, are totally asymptomatic. 
there's a mild febrile illness in about 20 to 30 percent, and then there's neurologic disease in 1 percent. And neurologic disease is associated with a slightly older demographic, 40s to 60s, not really elderly by any means, but um, younger people are more likely to be asymptomatic. And then advanced stage and diabetes has also been associated with a more severe <coughs> neurologic disease. So what do we see in the eye? 40 to 50 percent of patients with neurologic disease get a chorioretinitis. And we see these classic targetoid lesions in multiple stages of healing. That's pretty typical for um, West Nile virus. In more severe cases, we can see retinal vasculitis and ischemia. So we can see um, intraretinal hemorrhages, which are a sign of um, ischemia, um, definitely vasculitis, and even a neuroretinitis have been described. So West Nile virus is a flavivirus. It's a single-stranded, small RNA virus. Um, what we know, so this, the diagram on your right is sort of what we know from animal models, but basically the virions are transmitted through the bite of a mosquito and picked up, um, they infect and are, and are also just endocytosed by um, the local antigen presenting cells, so um, tissue regi resident macrophages, Langerhans cells, and um, other antigen presenting cells brought to the draining lymph nodes where they actually infect macrophages. The macrophages bring the virus to the spleen and then um, it's disseminated through the blood. So the virus has multiple proposed mechanisms of getting into the central nervous system. It can either go sort of as a Trojan horse inside a macrophage, which you can kind of see in, this, in the bottom here, um, through the blood-brain barrier, or actually the inflammation alone can cause some blood-brain barrier permeability and the virus can get in that way. And then the virus can transport through the central nervous system via anterograde and retrograde um, axonal transmission. Um, so interestingly, we know from culture, in vitro culture, that it replicates in RPE cells and exits the cells by exocytosis, which is significant because it doesn't destroy the cells like herpes virus, <clears throat> it just causes a total necrosis of the cells it infects. This virus actually gets out of the cell and leaves the cell intact. <clears throat> So some pathophysiology questions, <coughs> excuse me. Does the virus enter the eye from the CNS via the optic nerve and the neurofiber layer? <coughs> or does the, op does the virus enter via a compromised blood retinal barrier and then retrograde transport into the central nervous system? So we saw that it was um, more associated with diabetes and it's been associated also with diabetic ret retinopathy, with, um, which involves a compromise of the blood retinal barrier. Um, but potentially the virus itself, as has been shown in mouse models, could cause an endotheliopathy and these, this diabetic retinopathy-like picture and um, get into the, thanks, into the uh, retina um, through, through its own breakdown of the blood retinal barrier. So um, can we learn anything from this patient? Um, so this patient, so just kind of zooming in on the present, on presentation, this patient, we, ha we saw these white spots. We saw some uh, changes in the autofluorescence, and if we kind of zoom in, uh, looking at OCT to kind of find out what's involved, this area doesn't really have much going on in autofluorescence, but you see some subtle changes um, in the, at the level of the RPE. And this other lesion, we also see some subtle changes at the RPE. Um, so then a week later, dramatic increase in um, the number of white spots and in the autofluorescence, and also in the disruption of the RPE and um, overlying outer retina sometimes and um, the photoreceptor layer. So two weeks later, later we kind of can see some consolidation maybe of these lesions or some healing. Um, so the lesion uh, shown in OCT on your left, we can see almost like a, a consolidated RPE hyperfluorescence, maybe a scar, whereas the lesion on the right, although still apparent on autofluorescence, seems to be resolving on OCT. A month later, we kind of see the same picture. We have um, continued healing of that lesion on the right, where that lesion on the left has sort of still this persistent RPE level defect. And then two months later, it's the same thing. So some of these, le these lesions are involving the RPE, as we know from tissue culture. Um, and some of them are um, leaving a persistent RPE defect or a scar, and some of them are, are healing completely or nearly completely. So there's, um, so that's some evidence for RPE involvement. Others have proposed that this is actually, this is actually an infection that's coming through the retinal neurofiber layer, and the reason they think that is because those lesions seem to not be following the um, arcades, but actually the neurofiber layer. So that's um, this group, um, Kerala, they kind of show this map of the neurofiber layer, and that it, in their patient, the lesions seem to actually track the neurofiber layer rather than 
uh, along the arcade. So we actually kind of saw this too, if you recall. We do have lesions along the arcades, but then they're tracking um, actually along kind of the neurofiber layer path in both eyes. And then if we go recall back to the OCT, we did see neurofiber layer hyperfluorescence, hyperreflectivity, sorry, as well as these RPE changes. Um, so interestingly, in interesting, um, the, the fact that we see the lesion along um, a retinal neurofiber layer track but showing up on ICG suggests or tells us that the, the primary defect, as we saw in OCT, is really not that um, retinal neurofiber layer, but actually the level of the RPE. So possibly the virus is coming in through the neurofiber layer, but the pathology seems to really be, the significant pathology seems to be happening at the level of the RPE. So conclusion, ophthalmic observations can be important in elucidating viral pathogenesis. Thanks. Okay. Okay, just kind of taking you home here. Uh, so many of you know that uh, Lynn just uh, took her board examination. And uh, you know, sometimes they ask these really crazy questions like on your board examinations, like what's the pox next door? And then, <laughs> so what do Casanova, Idi Amin, and uh, Beethoven, and uh, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, and at least in my clinic, the church lady have in common? <laughs> So they're all at risk for syphilis. And each one of these people had syphilis. So I want to talk to you a little bit about syphilis. The, um, it's a very prevalent disease, uh, 18 million cases in 2002 uh, in the World Health Organization, uh, and 5.6 prevalent, uh, rather, incident cases. But 90% of these are in the developing world. And the United States, um, since They've been keeping records of this in the 40s. There's, uh, there was a very high percentage of uh, cases, and which has slowly decreased, decreased, decreased to a, uh, with a little blip in the 90s uh, around the uh, HIV AIDS epidemic, and then an all-time low in 2000 only to see this resurgence uh, with both an increase, uh, 17 or 18 percent increase in primary and secondary cases, and uh, also in congenital cases since 2000, the year 2000. Uh, there have been discrete epidemics of uh, syphilis in the Pacific Northwest uh, and in San Francisco. Um, there is no formal reporting system in the United States, however, there is in the United Kingdom. And it's interesting, there is not very many cases of syphilitic uveitis that are reported as compared to the number of cases of systemic syphilis. And calling the literature in the United States, it represents about 1 to 5 percent of uveitic cases that we see in a tertiary care setting. The thing is that there is a real, the, uh, HIV and syphilis travel together. So there's a very high rate of co-infection of these two organisms. So, you know, if you have, a co you have patients that are HIV positive, there's a 20% chance that you may have ocular involvement. And then conversely, um, syphilis uh, can be predictive of HIV co-infection. So always test for both uh, when you suspect either one in a patient. Um, acquired syphilis uh, is divided into three stages. And uh, the primary lesion is the, uh, the uh, chancre, uh, which occurs two to six weeks um, after ab abrasion of uh, the mucous membrane, followed by second, the secondary stage of syphilis six to eight weeks later following hematogenous spread of the organisms uh, throughout the body, lymph nodes, and into the central nervous system. And then this is followed by a variable degree of uh, tertiary syphilis, uh, either early, late, or latent. You have to know that, that uveitis can occur in any stage of this disease. Um, and it is called the great masquerader because it can produce pretty much anything and affect um, any, uh, any area of the eye. Uh, but about 50% of the time it presents as a posterior uveitis. So that's what we're talking about today and there are certain cl clinical presentations that are virtually pathognomonic of syphilis. The first is an acute syphilitic <coughs> posterior placoid retinitis. It's a mouthful. Um, and this were, presents as a uniform circular oval outer choroidal uh, lesion 
Uh, and uh, the typical patient is male, HIV positive, in about a third of the, third of the cases. And this is representative example. One can see this circular placoid lesion at the level of the RPE and choroid. And on fluorescein angiography, um, it shows this kind of leopard spotting in the early stage of the angiogram with uh, blocked fluorescence and then blocked fluorescence at the leading edge of this lesion, which stains uh, and leaks a little bit later in the later stages of the, um, of the angiogram. The same patient, I, I underwent ICG angiography, and I, ICG angiography shows, although not specific, can be highly suggestive of this disease, with a uniform hypofluorescence in the early and late phases of uh, the angiogram as seen here. And this can actually be helpful in certain cases that are very subtle that present in this placoid uh, lesion, as I'll show you uh, in a minute. Um, the uh, OCT of this is also quite helpful, and it shows discontinuity of the outer segment ellipsoid uh, with irregular nodular hyperreflectivity uh, at the level of the uh, RPE, and sometimes subretinal fluid uh, and um, uh, exter external limiting membrane um, disruption. The other distinctive uh, presentation is a panhebiitis with superficial uh, pre-retinal ex exudates. So these are not in the retina, they are just pre-retinal, they're small creamy white uh, lesions that, mi that seem to be migratory and may actually be, are frequently over vessels and may be associated with some uh, syphilitic retinitis which is typically uh, mild opacification of the retina and heals without disruption of the pigment epithelium or ne necrosis of the retina as, as Akbar had just described with uh, acute retinal necrosis or necrotizing herpetic retinopathy. And this is seen here in both a patient with, with that's HIV positive and a patient that's HIV negative with these precipitates here that seem to follow the blood vessels. The thing about these precipitates uh, is it's thought to be related to vasculitis and they disappear promptly with treatment. Uh, another mode of presentation is really just strictly with optic nerve involvement. This is a gentleman, a 57-year-old patient of mine that presented uh, with sores on his hands and his mouth and his tongue. That was a big tip-off as to you know, what was going on with him, and indeed he was uh, RPR and FTA positive, and I uh, showed this hemorrhage around his disc and hyperfluorescence of his optic nerve. So. There has been a description of a syphilitic outer retinopathy that was uh, described. This is actually a patient of mine that came in with these curvilinear uh, lesions here. Uh, that were initially described and thought to be azor, but it turns out that the patient, many of these patients were RPR positive, so syphilis was the diagnosis. And if you look really carefully in these areas, there really is a placoid lesion, and so it's thought that these uh, area, this syphilitic outer retinopathy is really a variant, a subtle variant of the um, uh, placoid uh, chorea retinopathy, and ICG can be helpful in that. Post-treatment, complete uh, revision uh, and, and return to normality in this particular patient. This patient presented three years later, okay, with profound reduction in vision and pan uveitis, as you can see here, okay? So patients with syphilis can become reinfected. So that is al always something uh, to keep in mind. And this, this patient was, uh, had a uh, RPR that was positive. He was treated, but unfortunately his vision did not recover. Uh, although his fundoscopic appearance was improved. So syphilis is a clinical diagnosis. Always consider it in your workup of patients uh, with uveitis. There's a highly variable presentation, but there are distinctive posterior pole presentations that should make you think of the diagnosis. Always inquire about other sexually transmitted diseases, and uh, in the workup, one must always uh, order specific uh, serological testing. So traditionally, we've ordered both non-treponemal and treponemal tests, the RPR and the FTA, ABS together. As you know, the um, RPR um, is, uh, is positive in the initial stages of the, of the infection and can wane in tertiary syphilis and with treatment, whereas the FTA remains positive for life. The uh, CDC has uh, recently recommended a so-called reverse sequence testing in which uh, Enzyme uh, immunoassays and chemoluminescent assays are used to screen for patients with toxoplasma with uh, syphilis as they, they have increased sensitivity and specificity as a screening test. And then the RPR is used to follow the treatment response. So in the case of a patient that is um, EIA uh, positive 
and RPR negative, which can happen, then there's kind of a tiebreaker of a very highly specific and sensitive test called the treponemal pallidum particle agglutination test, which is like a tiebreaker, which would confirm the diagnosis of uh, syphilis. Um, further testing, uh, as I said, always test for HIV in a patient with syphilis and vice versa. But patients with um, syphilis, ocular syphilis, are thought to have neurosyphilis. So the CDC recommends that these patients um, undergo a lumbar puncture and that they have a repeat lumbar, pun lumbar puncture if they are positive um, six months later. Um, the uh, treatment for syphilis is not with a shot of penicillin in the butt. Okay, it is a uh, neurosyphilitic uh, uh, regimen with intravenous uh, benzathine penicillin for 10 to 14 days, or desensitization in a penicillin uh, allergic patient, or procaine penicillin with probenicid. Uh, corticosteroids can be useful for uh, uh, patients with anterior segment inflammation, but very frequently, uh, patients with, depending upon the degree of inflammation in the back of their eye, will respond to antibiotic treatment alone. That being said, uh, another board type question is that um, after or during treatment, uh, one can develop a severe inflammatory, systemic inflammatory reaction and ocular inflammatory reaction known as the Erichsheimer uh, response in which steroids are definitely indicated and can be preventative. Uh, also, one would consider systemic steroids in a patient with, with structural complications and severe inflammation. So in summary, always think about syphilis in every, if I had to order one test, Okay, for syphilis, it would be an FTA um, because you can actually treat it and cure it. Um, there are certain, it can affect any time anatomic region in the eye, but there are certain distinctive presentations that should uh, really make you think about the diagnosis. Serologic testing is imperative, as is uh, uh, lumbar puncture in patients with ocular disease. Um, a multimodal imaging can be helpful, and the treatment is always with a neuro neurological dosing. Uh, and the visual outcomes are generally pretty good, um, uh, and there doesn't really seem to be a, uh, it was previously reported that HIV pa positive patients did more poorly, but recent evidence suggests that uh, they're about the same as patients that are HIV negative. So that's it. syphilis, do you, we don't have a whole lot more time, but I'd be happy to entertain any questions about the Grand Rounds presentation. Roger. Very nice, Alan. Do you have any, any pushback from the health department about FTA? one point you had to get an RPR first before they would let you do an Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, it, there was that there was actually pushback at AREP, but most of the ID people here, you know, uh, don't. First of all, the ID department does not use the reverse sequence testing regularly, and they always order the two tests together. It's imperative that the two are ordered together. Right. So we did, but, you know, we have a conversation with them and try to re-educate them about what ocular syphilis is about. All right. Yes, Ashley. <clears throat> so Dr. Larchelle talked about the, the study showing that there was less reoccurrence with um, with toxo if you use after every other day. Is that something that you guys practice here or Yeah, we do. So for um, so the biggest studies that I know about are, you know, those ones in Brazil in which uh, the effect lasted for as long as pe people were on prophylactic Bactrim, and, and they actually have 10-year follow-up on that. And uh, you know the effect lasted while they're on the medication, but then the, the recurrence rates seem to recur after they're off of, off of Bactrim three times a day. Pretty benign. Uh, they're 10% sulfa allergy in Bactrim. You have to be aware of. Uh, we do. I do routinely prophylax patients for uh, with Bactrim um, who have lesions that, particularly uh, in monocular patients with uh, lesions that are vision threatening close to the fovea, which many of them are, uh, or uh, to the optic nerve. Um, the other thing is that uh, there is one study that I'm aware of in which um, treating, so the biggest risk for a reactivation of toxoplasmosis is a previous infection with toxoplasmosis temporally. So if you've had a recent infection, you're more apt to have a recurrent infection, which is one of the rationales for treating patients with toxoplasmosis. The other, th the other thing is pathophysiologically, uh, it is thought that the, the organisms are, are assisted throughout the retina, not just in the scars, okay? Um, and that uh, for cataract surgery, there's one uh, uh, study that suggests that prophylactically treating patients before and after cataract surgery will reduce the rate of recurrence in the perioperative period for, um, for cataract surgery, just as with, uh, you know, viral, with herpes. 
Or, is that periodontal treatment? Is that full dose back room? Yeah, so, you know, I would give him back room twice a day for a week preoperatively and, and postoperatively. 